Sam. Sam, uh, we are honored by, by your presence here with us. We really appreciate for, for participating with us, Sam. And thank you, thank you so much. And Sam, let's get started with your conference. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Well, uh, Juan, hello, thank you very, very much for inviting me along. And uh, may I say, uh, hola, uh, como se estas? Uh, <laughs> mi nombre es Sam. Uh, no más hablo español. Tú no hables inglés, entonces mucho problemas. <laughs> so that, that is all of my Spanish there. So um, I hope it is okay to continue in English for about the next 40 minutes. Uh, talking uh, about comprehensive critical care echocardiography. And um, uh, as I said, it is an absolute privilege to have been invited along to, to talk to you uh, over in uh, Mexico. So uh, I work at Nepean Hospital. It is approximately a 600, 650 bed hospital here in Western Sydney. And we practice a lot of echocardiography at both a basic level or focused cardiac ultrasound as well as uh, at a more comprehensive level. Uh, performing it for diagnostic as well as monitoring techniques um, and uh, also some research. And the where I feel like critical care echo is at the moment is that we are in a rapidly escalating uh, period of time with critical care echo in Australasia and I'm sure with you over in, uh, in Mexico. I feel that uh, critical care echo and cardiology echo, we overlap in a, a great many ways. I think we struggle with some things that maybe cardiology finds um, more routine. Um, and we also do many things that cardiology finds uh, find very new and unique for them, such as you know, integrating lung ultrasound in with cardiology or looking at things like volume responsiveness. You know, these are things that cardiologists don't practice as often. And so we do overlap in a great way. And in my uh, experience with uh, teaching echocardiography, is it this, this, this part in the middle has the, maybe the tendency to get overlooked sometimes in the education uh, for critical care physicians who are practicing quite advanced echocardiography. And this is why we run many courses uh, trying to educate people appropriately in this and where this uh, document came from. So I wrote this with um, other, uh, other people in Australasia and in Europe, uh, such as the amazing Michelle Slama, to, who teaching critical care physicians at quite a higher level. And that is where we put together this group of areas which we felt it, it is not complete by any stretch. But these are some of the areas that are more commonly, um, maybe mistakes are made. And that is why we focused on a few areas which I hope would uh, provide some help to others. Overwhelmingly, I, I want to try and stress uh, that even at a, at a focused cardiac level or, or at a higher level, to integrate uh, echocardiography into a patient's management is difficult. And you must have accurate images so that you can then go on and make accurate interpretation which leads you then to the most difficult part of all of it for me which is integrating those echo findings into the management of that patient and that takes experience in intensive care or critical care as much as it takes experience in echocardiography and these two subspecialty or these two specialties joining together is what this is all about okay so I hope I'll provide you um, the examples from, uh, from which some of the pictures in the article came from, as well as a few others, and they're all trying to make it very clinically relevant to try and, ex to try and uh, highlight the cases, okay? So uh, I put these in no particular order uh, in the article, but when I'm presenting them here, I've put them in the order of, um, of the, ones, the, the things that I think are the most important first. And this is the, one of the more important points that I try and get across, which is about stroke volume assessment. Because we are taught 
we are taught about stroke volume assessment and they make it sound quite easy in the, uh, in the articles, uh, sorry, quite easy in textbooks sometimes. We know that if you have your cardiac output is made up of your heart rate times your stroke volume. We know that if we uh, can measure the uh, diameter or radius of our left ventricle outflow tract, we then times that by the left ventricle outflow tract VTI, we will have our stroke volume. Uh, because it is simply area times distance. We're going to use this for so many things in our care of our patients. Uh, I use it regularly for fluid responsiveness, to try and assess uh, response to when I've started a patient on noradrenaline, or we're trying to diurese a patient and maybe offload their right ventricle, or starting nitric oxide, uh, and that maybe improves blood flow to the left ventricle, improves diastolic dysfunction because the RV is no longer dilated, or mechanical support. And also, of course, uh, again, in that cardiology uh, section as well, it's important for valvular assessment because getting an accurate estimation of stroke volume, we can use things like estimating severity of aortic stenosis or how much mitral regurge we've got. So we must make sure that we are imaging this accurately so that we can then interpret it accurately and then put it into our, our patient's care. Because for example, if I take something like fluid responsiveness, I'm looking for a change in maybe 15% in the stroke volume to try and determine whether a patient will be responsive to fluid or not. I'm going to show you an example in a moment where if we are not imaging the stroke volume accurately and systematically, we can get it wrong by as much as 50% out. So if we're looking for something that has a 15% change, we must image it the same way every single time and be as accurate as possible. So we must be systematic. So this is how I think we should be doing stroke volume assessment every single time. We take a, a parasternal long axis view. We then must zoom in on the aortic valve Optimize the gain so that we don't have any fuzz that's in there. And we zoom in on the left ventricle outflow tract. We press pause. We go to mid systole when the aortic valve cusps are open. I then try and find where those cusps of the aortic valve enter into the left ventricle outflow tract. And that is where we make the measurement. We must zoom rather than just pause and measure because this will give us the best, um, I call it temporal resolution. It, is the, it, it means that the ultrasound machine just focuses in on that area. Once we have measured that LVOT diameter, we can get our area of the estimated area of that left ventricle outflow tract. Next, we move to our apical five chamber view. And the first thing I do is I put the color box over the aortic valve. And this gives me an idea of the direction of the blood flow that is coming from the left ventricle out through the uh, LVOT. And I then try and move my whole left ventricle outflow track onto the left side of my image so that I get the best Doppler angle. If I show you this uh, diagram that we have uh, on the right of the screen here, you can see that this this would be an apical four chamber view that we'd normally get, or apical five chamber view, excuse me. If I were to use this view, I would not be in the direction that the blood is flowing out of the heart. And this brings me to the next important point, which I'm sure I don't need to highlight too much to this audience, but this Doppler is angle dependent. This echo machine assumes that you are perfect. And it assumes that you are directly down the, uh, the line of blood flow. And that means that we must make sure that we are as close to that as possible. So I use color Doppler to help direct me as to where that line of sight needs to be for the pulsed wave Doppler through the left ventricle outflow tract. So when we get our pulse wave Doppler through the left ventricle outflow tract, our Doppler angle is as close to zero as we can possibly make it. The next part we have to do is try and get the, uh, the, the Doppler gate, the pulsed wave Doppler gate, exactly in the same position as we were measuring the LVOT diameter in our parasternal long axis view. And the way that we do this is we must see the closing click. So that is right at the uh, end of the triangle. Um, 
at the end of the triangle uh, of the LVOT, there is a line. And that is the closing click as the aortic valve closes. And what that tells us, as I said, is it makes sure that we are measuring our VTI, or the velocity time integral, in exactly the same position as we measured our diameter. Next thing we should do is shift uh, the baseline of our pulse wave Doppler trace up towards the top of the screen so that what we are interested fills the screen so that when we are measuring it, we measure it as accurately as possible. I increase up my sweep, sweep speed um, so that we only have three cardiac cycles on the screen. And again, it's so what I am measuring, it fills the screen. Uh, it is like trying to measure a, a left ventricle diameter. If you have the depth set at 25 centimeters, your heart will be tiny at the top of your screen and you will not measure it accurately. When you want to measure the left ventricle, you have it filling your screen. And it is exactly the same with Doppler so that we can make the measurements as accurate as we can. The final point is I say measure at modal velocity. And what I mean by that is I turn the gain of the whole Doppler picture down so that we don't have any fuzz. We don't have any of the, uh, it's like a beard. There's no beard there. We just have the brightest part of that pulsed wave Doppler trace. And that gives us uh, where the majority of the blood is flowing and we don't get any of the chaotic motion that can happen as blood is being forced out. And this gives us, uh, hopefully, the chance to measure things as accurately and as systematically as possible. So here we can see an example on the, uh, example on the left of the screen where the, the baseline is at the top of the screen. I only have three cardiac cycles in the picture. I have the Doppler profile filling the screen that I want to measure. I have the gain turned down and I uh, have the filters uh, which are reduced so that I have the flow going right to the baseline. And this means that I can measure that left ventricle outflow tract VTI accurately. And here I have a value of 27.2. Over on the right side of the screen, you'll see I've maybe exaggerated it a little bit, but uh, I, I have too many Doppler profiles in there. I have the gain turned up. I have the filters too high, so I can't see where I'm going to the baseline. And here I've got an LVO VTI of 33. So this is a good 15, 20% difference. Now, putting that all together, if I have an unzoomed view of my LVOT where I measure the diameter, if I don't measure my VTI correctly, all of these can compound so that I can have a stroke volume if I measured it correctly at 94 mils over here on the left of the screen. Whereas on the right of the screen, if I've overestimated my left ventricle outflow tract diameter because I haven't zoomed it or measured it properly, if I overestimate it from the VTI because I have the gain set too high, all of these uh, can overestimate it by as much as 50%. So just be mindful of the sources of error that we've got as we do stroke volume estimate because we must try and do it the same way every single time. So you must make sure your diameter is correct. Your Doppler angle is correct. Your pulse wave gate is in the right position. We make sure that we have measured the VTI as accurately as we, as we can. And understand that even with this, we still may not be getting the right things because there are other errors such as knowing that the VTI is not always circular and can sometimes be oval in shape, et cetera, et cetera. But we can try and be as systematic and uh, accurate as we can be each time. Okay, the next uh, importance of uh, tip um, was the idea of trying to get accurate Doppler imaging and I put this in the article as saying that we must use non-standard imaging windows if we're going to be using Doppler. So for example over here on the left of the screen we have a normal four chamber view okay and that's uh, shown by the uh, echo probe there in the white. Imagine I have tricuspid regurgitation coming through and it's going in the direction where it's pointing directly backward. If I use this image on the left and I were to use my uh, white uh, echo probe there, if I put my Doppler angle down there, the continuous wave Doppler angle, you can see that I'm not in the direction of where the cuspid regurgitation flow is. So what I must be able to do is I should move the whole probe more medially, which is where you can see the 
uh, red, the red echo marker there. And that means that the, I am much more in line with the tricuspid regurgitation jet that's coming through. Uh, and that gives me the accurate measurement of the tricuspid regurg. With the LVOT, again, if I have the five chamber view, we sort of discussed this already, but if I have that five chamber view, if I leave it in the center of the screen, if blood is flowing out of, from the LV to the aortic valve at an angle, and I put my uh, Doppler uh, cursor through it, I will not be on angle. So what I must do is swing it over to the left side of the screen by uh, fishtailing or, uh, uh, or rocking the probe uh, so that it is more medially, uh, more medially angled compared to before. And that will get me on angle for my Doppler uh, profile. This can be important in the patholo uh, pathological setting uh, if we have someone with a dilated cardiomyopathy, for example. So on the left side of the screen is the dilated cardiomyopathy. We see a, a big left ventricle that is not uh, functioning normally. On the right side, this is a normal heart. If we use the color Doppler box, we can see that the angle that blood enters into the left ventricle is different for these two uh, states. And this can be important if we're trying to look at something like diastolic dysfunction and we want to measure the mitral valve inflow velocities for the E and the A wave, we must swing that probe, uh, place that probe maybe more laterally on the chest so that we are on the angle of that. Okay, so what about uh, the, the next uh, process to, to consider or the next, next pearl is this idea that clinical context is everything. Um, it, it can be tricky to try and take just the echo information by itself and come with a diagnosis. You know, sometimes the ultrasound is the, uh, a diagnostic tool and sometimes it is a monitoring tool. And I'll use a case to example this. We had an 84 year old man who collapsed. He was hypotensive and he had a history of being a diabetic and a heavy smoker. He was in septic shock. Uh, we had grown staph in his blood cultures. He had a raised lactate. He was acidotic and he was on a reasonable level of, reasonable level of noradrenaline. His hands were both cool and peripherally shut down. But when we examined him, we felt that the right was maybe worse than the left. And we were particularly worried about the digits on uh, the index and middle finger, which as you can see, uh, look maybe more dusky compared to the rest of the hand. So with that in place, I was trying to worry, are we dealing with maybe a septic emboli? Are we dealing with infective endocarditis? Or are we just dealing with peripheral microcirculatory collapse from someone who is trying to die from septic shock. So we had a look at his heart. We can see here that we've got a normal sized ventricle that shows signs of significant hypertrophy and it is not functioning well at all. And we have moderate if not severe systolic dysfunction. The right ventricle looked generous in size it again didn't look like it was severely abnormal, but it didn't look like it was maybe contracting perfectly. I can see an aortic valve that looks thickened. I can't see any obvious lesions which would suggest infective endocarditis, but of course that cannot be excluded. And the mitral valve also showed signs of mitral annular calcification, which made me think that maybe these valves are just showing signs of chronic degenerative change. In the short axis view, I start to get a suggestion that maybe we have some regional wall motion abnormalities. The left ventricle is definitely not functioning normally. I was worried about the septum, the inferior walls, in particular appeared akinetic, particularly in some of those basal regions. The lateral wall was the one that looked like it was functioning the best, but again, it was far from perfect. And here we have a picture at the base, the mid ventricle level and the apex of the heart. In the apical four chamber view, again, I get this suggestion that this lateral wall is doing more than the septum. 
the apex appears absolutely stationary to me and was not moving much at all. In the two chamber view, the inferior wall in particular uh, around that basal area looked thinned, hyperechoic uh, and akinetic, all suggesting that we have some horrible chronic uh, maybe inferior or circumflex coronary artery ischemia. That apex looked thinned, akinetic, uh, and uh, maybe a little bit bright, suggesting again chronic ischemia maybe in the LAD territory. And that goes with the idea that that anterior wall there was not working well either. Maybe some of the more observant starts putting a few things together and you're seeing something that doesn't look quite right, which is that smokiness that's sitting in the middle of the heart. And that's called SEC, or we call it spontaneous echo contrast. And maybe even the more, the, the more observant, again, something isn't right in that apex. And this is, and you're exactly right, and this is what we're seeing is a horrible, massive thrombus. But I didn't really see it brilliantly when I was using the standard echo windows before of the four chamber and the two chamber and the short axis views. And I had to go off axis uh, to see that at the top of the heart and the apex, there is this huge, you know, three by two centimeter uh, thrombus that's sitting there in an area of apical akinesis. And this elderly gentleman had probably chronic undiagnosed ischemic heart disease. And he had apical akinesis that uh, had this thrombus in. And when he got sick with sepsis, maybe some of this or, or an infective endocarditis lesion flicked off. Uh, you know, we, got, we found there were many potential sources of emboli in this gentleman. And obviously this helps direct management in terms of trying to consider anticoagulation if the risk doesn't outweigh the benefit. Okay, let's move on to the next thing, which is suggesting uh, that we need to use all information that we possibly can to recognize that there are significant valvular abnormalities. So when patients are critically ill, we find not infrequently significant valvular abnormalities. And again, a probably don't need to persuade you that sometimes this isn't as straightforward as it is in the textbooks. I think if we just use color Doppler by itself, we can get into trouble. I'm always going to encourage my, my trainees and my fellows that if you think that there is moderate or severe valvular abnormality, we must look downstream and we must use all Doppler parameters at our disposal to try and understand whether we've got significant or valvular abnormalities that are affecting this patient's care. Some of the classic things like in severe aortic stenosis, uh, the cardiologist would say that you have massive hypertrophy and you have a poorly functioning ventricle. Absolutely, those are true. If you've had aortic stenosis, this has built up over, uh, has built up over years. But in the critically ill, we can get significant abnormalities that can happen like that. And that's why we have to learn to use other, other things at our disposal. So I'll use another example. Um, and this case always stuck with me because uh, I'm sure the doctor who did this won't mind me saying some of this. I just finished up my fellowship and I became a consultant. I've been a consultant for maybe three months and uh, I'd started work at my hospital uh, that I'm at and there was a doctor there who just passed their senior echo exams for critical care. So they were stamped as being an expert. And this was the case that, that came to me one night um, when they phoned me up and asked if I was on call. I, I said I wasn't, uh, but can I help? And they said, no, don't worry. And they hung up. And uh, we went through this case and... Um, she came to a conclusion that maybe this valvular lesion that we're about to see was uh, put down as mild to moderate. And this was not a mild to moderate disease. This is rip roaring, severe, horrific disease. And I'm sure that 
the, the error had come about because I don't think they'd seen a lot of severe acute valvular pathology. So they didn't recognize the patterns that they didn't look downstream of the lesion to see if there were any problems. And um, they hadn't put it into clinical context. So the, the cases of a 75 year old lady who had a, a non ST elevation myocardial infarction. They had a background of a bioprosthetic aortic valve and they were known to have some ischemic heart disease in the past. During the angiogram, the patient went into cardiogenic shock and an emergency call was put out. A uh, drug eluting stent was put into the, the left main coronary artery as well as the circumflex. And we needed to intubate the patient urgently during the procedure. And because of the left main disease uh, and the fact that this patient was in cardiogenic shock, the patient had an intra aortic balloon pump put in. They were brought back down to the intensive care unit and over the next four hours, we just saw the inotropes go up and up and up. This was the intra-aortic balloon pump trace uh, along with the ECG trace. And what it shows straight away is that this balloon pump is not working. And this should have been, again, part of this clinical context that something horrific was happening and that this balloon pump was not doing its job. So all these pictures you're about to see were taken by this doctor. And I think they're pretty good. You know, it's not difficult imaging. Um, so it's not easy imaging in the critically ill. And so these are pictures that, you know, we might not put in a textbook, but they're, they're not awful. And we can get the information that we need, which is that this left ventricle is working hard. We're not seeing any horrible regional wall motion abnormalities on this view. But that aortic valve, there is something strange about it and that there's a valve that when it shuts, it looks abnormal to me. If we put color flow over the valve, we can see that there's this eccentric abnormal flow that's going on that should again start telling us that there is a significant abnormality occurring. In the short axis view, I'm worried that that non-coronary cusp is abnormal and it is floating freely in the wind. In the apical five chamber view, we can look at the regurgitation flow. So that's the flow that is coming towards the probes. So it is above the baseline. And the, the, the trainee had done this uh, aortic regurgitation pressure half time, but they weren't confident with the uh, measurement because they thought that the regurgitation flow was eccentric. And so we had, uh, we had an incomplete Doppler profile maybe, but they attempted to measure the pressure half time. They got a value of 90 milliseconds. And we often say that if it's less than 250, that is severe um, regurgitation. But the trainee didn't like that parameter because, as I said, they were worried that we had a regurgitation and an incomplete, uh, sorry, eccentric regurgitation and an incomplete uh, Doppler profile. And then this is the key. They even went on and looked at the suprasternal view. So putting a probe at the suprasternal notch, looking down at the aorta. And that's what you can see down here in the bottom left hand picture this uh, flow that is going through the aorta. You often don't see it well with just simple uh, 2D imaging, and you must use your Doppler, uh, your Doppler profile, the pulse wave Doppler, sitting in the, uh, in the descending aorta, which is what you see in the top right of the screen there. And that's the bit to look at, okay? That is diastolic flow reversal that lasts the entire of distally, uh, so the entire of diastole, excuse me, which is from the end of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And that must have, you know, that must give you alarm bells that if you see hollow diastolic flow reversal in the aorta during diastole, that is a sign of significant aortic regurgitation and should have immediately prompts you to think that this is not mild or moderate. We are dealing with significant aortic regurgitation, which is of course a uh, contraindication for an intra-aortic balloon pump. 
I'm so sorry. Can you just give me pause one for a second? Darling, the internet's not working very well. Do you mind maybe turning it off? We went ahead and did a transesophageal echo, which confirmed this, that we had horrific dehiscence of one of the aortic valve leaflets. Um, and what we see there is a massive aortic regurgitation coming into the LVOT. And of course, this is uh, a contraindication, as I said, to the intra-aortic balloon pump. This is what we saw in the uh, descending aorta of that patient. And here you can see that a bit clearer may be this hollow diastolic uh, flow reversal. And this is, of course, after we'd taken out the intra-aortic balloon pump. The conclusion that we'd had before uh, we uh, did the transesophageal echo is that we had severe AR. We had the bioprosthetic aortic valve with evidence of severe leaflet disruption. Even though we had normal LV systolic function, we had signs of severe LV diastolic dysfunction. And overall, this was a, a severe acute valvular catastrophe with very significant aortic regurgitation and that balloon pump needed to be taken out. Um, unfortunately, this, it wasn't recognized for, for many hours, the severity of the aortic regurgitation, despite what I think was uh, evidence on the pictures that were originally obtained. And again, it's just the importance of using all the information that you have available to you when you're worried about significant valvular pathology um, and don't miss severe regurgitation. So we can use a similar kind of idea that if you have severe aortic regurgitation, you will have diastolic flow reversal in your aorta for things like the tricuspid valve. If you have severe tricuspid valve regurgitation, you must look at your um, hepatic veins. And that would be in the same view that you look at your inferior vena cava. We can just put our pulse wave Doppler in that uh, hepatic vein there and we get a profile where if you see systolic flow reversal in your hepatic vein, that's associated with significant tricuspid regurgitation. And this is what the profile will look like with the flow in systole above the line rather than normally it's below the line and bigger than the diastolic flow. What about mitral regurgitation? Well, we've got a couple of things that help us with mitral regurgitation. So i use something a little different. Um, so first of all, look at this guy here. So I'm going to ask you to look at this profile and tell me what you think uh, on the color flow um, pattern, first of all. So on the bottom right image, how bad do you think the mitral regurgitation is that? Because with color, uh, color Doppler, we say that if the regurgitation reaches the back wall or if it's greater than 50 or 60% of the left atrial uh, area, then that's a sign of significance. So on that basis, we can say that this is mild. But again, maybe the more observant of you are looking at is that we see lots of chaotic motion in that color flow. It almost looks like it's uh, an eccentric looking jet. And with that, we can say that all bets are off and that we can't use color flow by itself. If we look at the uh, LV inflow parameter over here on the top left, uh, we see an E and an A wave. So E is the early filling of the uh, left ventricle. And that occurs just after the T wave. And then the A wave occurs with the atrial kick. And the big thing I'm going to ask you to look at is the speed of that mitral valve E wave. So it's the MVE velocity, which is greater than 1.2 meters a second. And when we see a mitral valve E wave velocity, so that's the early filling of that mitral valve. If that is greater than 1.2 meters per second, that's indicating severe mitral regurgitation. It goes with the theory that if you have a whole bunch of blood that regurgitates into the left atrium, when it then comes back into the left ventricle, you have much greater blood volume and so a much higher mitral valve E wave velocity. Again, just be careful, you've got to be, if someone has a hyperdynamic circulation, as in with something like severe sepsis maybe, or septic shock, excuse me, then again, all flows can increase. 
But it's just another tip that if you have an E-wave velocity greater than 1.2, look for significant mitral regurgitation. Another way that we can do it is we look downstream. Okay, so we look where that mitral regurgitation, if it goes into the left atrium, that is going to lead to impaired filling from the pulmonary veins. So if you look at the pulmonary vein flow, we get this systolic blunting. So that number that's marked there in the one, that's flowing systole. Now normally that flow in the pulmonary vein is higher than the flow in diastole. So normally the one, the pulmonary vein systolic flow is greater than the pulmonary vein diastolic flow. If it's round the other way, that is a sign of significantly raised left atrial pressure, and that can be associated with significant mitral regurgitation. Okay, a few more to go, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll uh, take some questions. So this is a quick one. Um, uh, so this is the uh, idea that we, again, on the Doppler profile, so not so much the Doppler numbers, this is more the Doppler pattern that we can start picking up uh, useful information. And this is a really great one for me, and I, I love this one. It's called the flying W sign. So if we look at the right ventricle outflow tract, so that's putting our pulse wave just before the pulmonary vein, uh, excuse me, putting it in the, just before the pulmonary valve, we can get an idea of what blood flow coming out of the right ventricle looks like. And normally it is just a triangular shape, except in significant pulmonary hypertension. And in significant pulmonary hypertension, you can get this W pattern that occurs called the flying W sign. And this occurs, it's got something to do with harmonics. And I gotta be honest, I don't understand the physics behind it. Um, all I know is that if you have a W pattern in the right ventricle outflow tract flows, it is a sign of significant pulmonary hypertension. Another good one is looking for significant diastolic dysfunction in the left ventricle. If we look at the uh, LV inflow pattern, we've got our E and our A wave. And sometimes we get this little bit in the middle, which is called the B bump. So that's the, the arrow is slightly off, but pointing to that in between the E and the A wave, there's a little bit of a bump. Now, we can see that in normal people. So normal, young, generally uh, fit, healthy people who are relatively bradycardic, you can get something that looks like this. But I don't seem to find many of them in the critically ill. And what I see is we come across this sometimes. Uh, it's not as common as the flying W sign, but we see this not infrequently, and it's a sign of at least moderate diastolic dysfunction and raised left atrial pressure. Okay, this is a, this is a big one. Um, right ventricle dysfunction is rife in our patients. You get anyone with ARDS or a patient who's stuck on a ventilator with significant PEEP requirements, patients with severe septic shock, so they actually have direct myocardial damage. All of these guys are at risk of right ventricle dysfunction. And we know from lots of evidence done by the Europeans that right ventricle dysfunction is associated with worse outcomes uh, in the intensive care unit. We've got lots of data from the cardiology literature that we know that if, it's, if you've got coronary artery disease or heart failure or pulmonary hypertension, all of these things are associated with worse outcomes. So we've got to pick it up if it happens. And sometimes it's not as straightforward as it looks. Um, this is a great uh, article that was written, came out, I think it was either for last, um, by the European, uh, by the European, um, heart, uh, uh, European Heart Journal, of, um, and they talk about all the parameters that we could look at with echo. And there's one really big one that's missing. So we are normally going to look with TAPSI or we can measure it with fractional area change, or we can look at the movement of the, the interventricle septum, or we can look with tissue Doppler at the movement of the annulus. So we use all of these things to estimate routinely how that right ventricle is working. 
And the one that's missing off this, in my opinion, is you. It's you looking at a uh, hundred or a thousand echoes and recognizing when something doesn't look right. And that is the subjective assessment of right ventricle function. Because what I'm going to show you an example of is that sometimes some of these values are normal and the right ventricle is anything but. This is a really nice study, uh, I think, that came out a few years ago, talking about heart failure in patients with RV dysfunction. They got a bunch of doctors to look at echoes and say whether they thought the RV function was normal, mild, or moderately severely abnormal. And what you can see down here in terms of the hazards ratio is when they just use TAPSI alone, which is one of the more common ways that we're going to look at the right ventricle, the hazards ratio was not significant, but it was, it was, you know, it was pretty good, but it didn't quite reach significance. Uh, but again, suggested that if the RV was abnormal on the TAPSI, that was associated with worse outcomes. What was better than that was just a bunch of people who knew what they were looking at, looking at the echoes saying, yeah, that's normal or no, that's, that's significant. And that hazards ratio was much better and reached significance. Again, just suggesting that, the eyeball is a really important part of assessing the right ventricle. I'll use an example that we had through the other day. 68 year old lady, she's short of breath. She's got a CTPA that shows that she's got a large PE. She is cardiovascularly stable, but just doesn't look right. On the echo, which wasn't easy, I get the idea that that RV is big. And what I want you to look at, particularly in this top right picture, is how that ventricle is moving. Because the base is moving and it's moving towards the apex and it's moving kind of vigorously, I guess. But that free wall is just not working. We do a TAPSI routinely the TAPSI is greater than 16 millimeters. So the TAPSI is normal, right? Oh, we must have normal RV function. So let's go and have a look at the TDI. So the tissue Doppler imaging that we've got down here in the bottom right shows that we've got a systolic motion of greater than six or eight centimeters a second, whichever guidelines you want to use. So that's also suggesting that the right ventricle function is normal. But what we've got to remember is that we're just looking at one single point and how it moves and the speed with which it moves with these two parameters. And they can miss stuff, right? They can miss that right ventricle free wall. In this case, fractional area change is a useful parameter to think about. And if we measure the uh, diameter or the area um, at diastole and measure it at end systole and we can put them as a percentage, we get an idea if it's greater than 35%, that's normal. And if it's less than 35%, that's abnormal. <coughs> Excuse me. And this picked up that the fractional area change was markedly reduced and that we had some form of abnormality. But I've got to be honest, this isn't a parameter that I do all that often. I do it in here because I'm giving a lecture and it really sort of emphasizes my point. But the most important thing for me was, was just being able to look at that picture and say that that is not right. I do not believe that TAPSI or that S prime because it doesn't make sense. I've got a big ventricle. I've got a PE. I've got abnormal function here. And these parameters, things like strain can help. Uh, but again, that's, I think, uh, sort of more research based at this moment. So the important thing is, is to use your eyeball, first of all, and be a clinician. You know, this lady did not look right. Although she was cardiovascularly stable, she was significantly short of breath, big right ventricle on, uh, on echo, not good looking function of that RV free wall. This lady has severely abnormal, uh, I think she's got abnormal right ventricle function. The next big question is, do you thrombolize these patients or not? And I think that's, uh, that's again, a debate, uh, a debate for another time. Uh, and in my opinion, considering things like half dose thrombolysis when people have got these abnormal looking right ventricles uh, is worth considering. Okay, another one of my favorites to talk about is LVOT obstruction. Um, I put in the article LVOT obstruction, don't miss it. And that's because of this study. So this study done by Michelle Slama's group uh, and Jean-Louis Chavet found that they looked at 
over 200 patients with septic shock over an 18 month period or 28 month period, excuse me. And they found that in a huge number of patients, they found, uh, they found LVOT or they found interventricular or LVOT obstruction. They use this to suggest that, uh, you know, for these one in five patients they found with this um, LVOT or interventricular obstruction, that was associated with hypovolemia. And if you have hypovolemia, they had mortalities that were 55% versus 33% in the rest of the patients. So we've got to be careful we don't miss it because significant hypovolemia is shown here to be associated with worsening mortality. I'm going to just add in, and on the flip side, I think we've also got a hell of a lot of evidence out there saying that giving patients too much fluid in this circumstances is also associated with higher mortalities. So I think we must be careful. We don't give our patients too little fluid and we don't give our patients too much. And that is really hard. What are we looking for in these patients? Well, we are looking for systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral valve leaflet or SAM. Uh, this is why it's one of my favorite diseases. Um, so we must look for this movement uh, during systole of that anterior mitral valve leaflet getting pulled into the left ventricle outflow tract, blocking flow coming out through the left ventricle. We would see this turbulent blood flow or this chaotic uh, motion during the LVOT that you can see here in the green. And that characteristic late peaking Doppler flow profile when you put continuous wave Doppler down through that LVOT. And that can be associated with eccentric MR, which can particularly be anteriorly directed because that leaflet is pulled, the anterior leaflet is pulled into the LVOT. And here we can see an example of this 84 year old woman who's got a non ST elevation MI. And we have a kissing uh, ventricle sign with the walls that come together during systole. And this is associated with some chaotic motion uh, on color Doppler uh, flow through the LVOT. And it's subtle, but can, you, can I persuade you that that anterior mitral valve leaflet, the one on the left in the picture there, is getting pulled into the left ventricle outflow tract during systole. And what makes it easier to see is this. Uh, when I put continuous wave down through, I get this late peaking jet that's mixed in there with the ordinary aortic valve flows, but I can see this late peaking jet, which I mark there with the number one. Uh, and that's a sign of ventricular, uh, and that's a sign of the interventricular obstruction. I can use pulsed wave Doppler to step back. So here I'm in the, the LVOT. I then come back a little bit further into the ventricle, back a little bit further, back a little bit further. And each one of those can give me an idea if I can still see this late peaking jet that there is still signs of obstruction there. But it gives me the idea that it gets less and less and less as I go back. So the main point of obstruction there is in the LVOT at that sigmoid shaped septum, not the mid ventricle. And here are two really, really good recent review articles that are, that are written on this subject, um, particularly ones from Michelle Slama and from some of my colleagues who I work with at Nepean Hospital. Okay, um, the, the final thing I might mention just in the last minute um, is, was originally in the article and uh, the reviewers asked me to take it out. And I replaced it with something on the IVC um, which I think has been spoken about many, many times before about how inaccurate uh, the IVC is for uh, estimating fluid responsiveness. And I do not use the IVC uh, really to assess patients' um, volume status. It's basically good if it's tiny and collapses, sure, you've got reduced right atrial pressure and you're probably fluid responsive. If it's massive and fat, uh, it there are multiple confounders. Um, and I think probably pick up some of those with clinical examination alone. The big one for me is this, and I'll be really interested to hear if this is the same with you guys in, uh, sub, uh, in Mexico. Um, it's relationships with cardiology. So as in Australasia, we have about one in 10 intensivists to use advanced echo uh, daily. Of those, 50% feel that they practice at the level of the, a cardiologist. And that causes problems sometimes because cardiologists disagree. 
and sometimes we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of arguments with cardiology, and I think that is detrimental. Um, I think we need cardiology, particularly when we're learning to, because these guys are the people who practice echo every day. They, they look at a thousand echoes a year. Some of them may not be great at doing it. Um, and some of them are absolutely amazing at doing it. And we need to try and find out, find out the ones who are particularly good at it and make friends with them because they need to mentor us as we learn. I like having these guys in there because I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not an expert. I, I don't know about congenital heart disease very well. I don't look uh, about deciding when a patient needs to go to surgery. I need help. I'm good probably 95% of the time, but there are 5% of my patients that I need to talk to them uh, about how to manage these patients. And that means I've got to have friends and I've got to have friends that I can phone up. I like to attend their meetings because that's where we get continued medical education. I like presenting at their meetings, even though it's scary presenting in a room of cardiologists, some of whom, some of whom think that I shouldn't be practicing at this level because it challenges me. And finally, I think we need to have shared archiving systems, shared archiving systems to help, uh, to help progress. And that's it really. Um, I think the most important thing is to say that this specialty is growing. Uh, I think it's user dependent. I think we've got to know our strengths and limitations. And the final, the most important thing is just to remember that clinical context is everything with our patients. And you're not just a sonographer, you're a doctor first. And you've got to integrate your echo findings into the patient's care, not the uh, other way around. And that's it. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for your amazing conference. Are you, are you listening? Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Yes, thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you once again for accepting this conference. We are really, really honored by your presence. Uh, it was thank an you. amazing, amazing topic, an amazing conference. Uh, surely there will be some questions, Sam. Um, well, uh, one question is, Sam, how do you measure the cardiac output in patients with atrial fibrillation? I think that it is a very specific yeah, very topic. Nice. topic. But good good question. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult, and I just follow the standard guidelines um, suggested by the American Society of Echo, which says that we measure in exactly the same way as I described. So measuring the LVOT accurately, measuring the VTI accurately, in sinus rhythm, I take three uh, LVOT measurements and I average them. In AF, I take five. So it is always, uh, don't just take one and go with that. I average them out. In, in the critically ill, when we have maybe changes in the respiratory variation, I also try to do it at the same time in the respiratory cycle, which is at the end of expiration or the... Uh, uh, in the same uh, whether you're mechanically ventilated or not so again it's just doing it this it's like examining a patient i do it the same way every single time so that i try and make sure it is as accurate and systematic as possible very good thank you so much sam another question sam is uh, can you give us some pearls of tips about how to measure the stroke volume or the cardiac output in patients when we are doing a passive leg raising, Sam, because I think more of, more, uh, most of the audience are intensivists or emergenciologists, and truly they want to know how to measure the, or how to do the passive leg raising by using echo, Sam. Juan, am I able to exit out of my talk and uh, bring something else up on my screen? Will people still see that? Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah, I didn't put it in and I apologize for that. I, I, I tried to choose the ones that I thought would be most, uh, most interesting. Um, and I'm sorry I left out this because it's a great, great talk. And let me just bring up this picture. Uh, yes, take your time. Don't worry. Thanks, man. Okay. It's hard. Uh, this is another, this is, I put this in the, in the article as well. Can you see that? Is that okay? Yes, is that, it's perfectly uh, okay. Right. So I think, um, again, I, I think when I was learning this, you read it in the textbooks and you're like, oh, it's really, really easy to do. And uh, I find that actually when you're doing it in critically ill, I, I find it quite challenging. 
the, the first thing is to say is that when you've got to start off, um, I stand on the left side of the patient, not on the right side of the patient. And I stand on the left side of the patient because there's always lots of stuff in the way, like the tubes. Uh, my patients are quite obese. So, and I also find it's easier for doing passive leg raising maneuver. So I start with the patient at 30 to 45 degrees head up, of course, and I get a decent uh, five chamber view and I hold my hand on the patient uh, as you can see here in the insert. What, what I'm doing there is I'm anchoring my hand, not just holding the probe on the patient. And I anchor my hand in such a way so that my probe doesn't move. Because of course, if we're gonna do a maneuver, we must make sure that our angle of interrogation doesn't change. Because if you are off angle a little bit, uh, it can be a bit harder when the patient is then head down so you must make sure you're in exactly the same place. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so I anchor my hand, I have my probe in the same position and I make a measurement. And again, I take an average of three cardiac cycles at end expiration. I then get someone else. So again, it's a two person technique. I then get someone else to move the bed. They first, they flatten down the, the whole bed so it's completely flat and then they lift up the legs of the bed. And it's important you don't lift up the patient's legs manually because that can cause a sympathetic, um, uh, sympathetic action. You know, I want to have that patient as sort of comfortable uh, as possible. Yeah. So then by moving the bed, uh, the patient is not disturbed too much and you don't get that sympathetic activity. And then you wait for a minute or so and then you make the measurement again in exactly the same way with the pulse wave Doppler in exactly the same position with your hand in the same position, Doppler angle at the same position and you make the measurements again at end expiration. Very good. Um, and I'm sorry, I did forget to say that the, um, uh, of course the patient, uh, uh, ideally I find it more accurate if the patient is fully mandatory ventilated, but it does work if they are spontaneously breathing as well. Yes, of course. Do you have some pictures about this specific maneuver? Uh, as you showed in your article, some pictures about this maneuver. And can you show us a little bit of, of this maneuver in your slides? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I've got... Um, yeah, let me see if I can pull it up. Do you mean ever what the pictures look like? Yes. Uh, right now we are watching your, your, your slides. I'm going to need to get my hard drive. Just give me one sec. Kaz, can you pass me my hard drive, please? Yeah, sure. While yeah. I load it up, is there another question while I find yes. the... Well, yes, of course. Well, um, Sam, how do you measure the diastolic function in patients with mitral, mitral uh, regurgitation? We know that yeah. um, sometimes we need to evaluate, for instance, the, the capillary wet pressure in our patients. For us, it's very important. More, uh, most of the physicians or intensivists, uh, non-cardiologists, we are very interested in evaluate the, the diastolic function in our ICU patients because, as, you, as we know, it's very yeah. useful for, for the winning process, for the fluids, etc. And wow. for us, it's very important. Very, very interesting to hear you say yeah. that. Um, there was a lot of debate going on uh, on this subject. I, I think diastolic dysfunction, just the same as what you were saying, it, it's such an important parameter for us to start getting our head around. And in the critically ill, I think we're finding more and more that this, the way that we are analyzing it is not perfect. And we have huge variations in the way that we do it. It's probably just good at extremes, I think we're finding. Um, and the, the, the bit in the middle where we need it the most, it, it's, not, it's not perfect. Um, I use E on E prime, uh, the same as the same as everyone, I'm sure. And I use E on E prime, and I know that if I have significant regurgitation, it's rubbish. I use E on E prime. I use values greater than 18 to be indicative of pulmonary artery occlusion pressures, which are raised. And I know that it can be far from perfect. I think. Estimating left atrial pressure when you have significant mitral regurg using standard parameters is not accurate. And I think simply having significant mitral regurg is enough to say that we have significantly raised left atrial pressure. And if you've got someone who's critically ill with that, we must, uh, we must watch their fluid status very carefully. Yes, maybe, well, this is another topic, but 
maybe we have to take a look at the lungs. <laughs> oh, uh, absolutely, hundred percent. Of course, yes. yes. Um, and I find it very, very useful having these two things together. If you have raised left atrial pressure, looking at lung ultrasound uh, absolutely is essential, and it's a really nice, uh, really nice um, thing okay. together. Yes, of yeah, course. Really nice. Let me show you this. Um, yes. Sorry, flicking through a million talks. I hope you don't mind. Ah, oh, no problem. Uh, that's not it. Um, here we go. So, um, sorry. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. If you don't have it, no problem. No, no, I got it here. So fluid responsiveness, of course, is this idea that we are on the ascending portion of this uh, Frank Starling curve. Yes. And if we have patients who uh, uh, increase up their stroke volume with, um, with a fluid bolus, they are on the ascending portion. And obviously with the passive leg raising, uh, that is a reversible thing that we can do to give us an idea. Yes. Um, we're looking for the respiratory variation so that if there is significant change in the stroke volume uh, with inspiration and expiration uh, and uh, the SVC uh, looking with toe at the superior vena cava is the best. I use 36% uh, relatively arbitrary, but if, if you have a significant change with inspiration and expiration when you're fully mandatory ventilated, this is the best one. The next best one is the passive leg raising, okay, which is I, I do it two ways, okay? So this is the first way I do it. I look at uh, the VMAX or the, uh, the peak, and uh, so it's mainly this one on the left side of the screen. I look to see if there is a big change uh, with inspiration to expiration, uh, and if there is a big change, I will then move on to doing a passive leg raising maneuver. So I start with that one on the left. Big sweep, so the sweep speed has been uh, increased so that we have many cardiac cycles in there. So this is bad for doing LVO, TV, TI, but it is good for looking at changes in the, the peak, uh, the VMAX. After I've done that, I will then, and I don't think I have a picture of this, so maybe I'll just explain it to you. I would then decrease the sweep speed. So the same way as if I was just doing a stroke volume, so I have three cardiac cycles and I measure the VTI, end expiration, and I take the average. Then I move up to this and I do the passive leg raising. Yes. And then I do exactly the same thing again. And I see if I have a change in that VMAX, if that, that change in the VMAX has gone away. And if the VTI, measuring it in exactly the same way, if that is increased by, I use 20%. Uh, if that is increased by 20%, that is a sign of being fluid responsive and I would give them some fluid. I use 20% because I know all the evidence says 12, some says 13%, some says 15%. All I know for some of the reasons, as I hope I've explained in my lecture, uh, there's a, it's easy to make mistakes. So I, have a, I sort of have a bit of a gray zone and that's why I use 20% because I think it's more accurate. Yes, very nice. It's a very great tip, uh, Sam, because uh, ma surely many of us, uh, we, have, uh, we have read a lot of literature, and the literature, as you said, uh, only mentions that the, 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 the cutoff is uh, maybe 12, maybe 15, and 20%, I think, is a very good tip. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, very, yeah. very, interesting, uh, very interesting, Sam. And what is the, the value, uh, Sam, that you give to the diastolic function in patients specifically uh, with sepsis? Because yeah. uh, it seems that there, there are uh, some yeah. articles and some papers about this specific topic. Oh. Actually, you have, written, you have written about this topic, so I want to take advantage of your presence here. So I would, like to, I would like to hear you exactly about this this specific topic, because in my opinion, it's very interesting, and you you are one of the worldwide experts. In, so, oh, so, I so I, I don't want, know about that. <laughs> I want, but to, I'm but I'm very interested in the subject. Let yeah. me bring see if I can find this article. Um, so yeah, the I I I think this is hard. 
And I think it, it holds a lot of importance. Yes. Um, so let me start off with this article, first of all, that we wrote. So this is with a good friend of mine, David Clancy, uh, and he was my uh, Echo Fellow the year before last, and he, he picked up ultrasound so quickly, and he's an amazing, amazing guy. And so we spent, um, we spent a, a year or two talking about this subject so much. Okay because there's a lot of evidence out there, right? Let me see if I can find some other evidence about, you know, like the Landsper people, they, there's so many people who are coming out with this idea that in, uh, that in patients with sepsis, there is uh, a huge amount of prognostic indicators in here. So here we go, prognostic value of ventricular diastolic dysfunction in patients with sepsis. Another article that suggests that in septic patients, uh, Systolic function is not associated with increased mortality, but it's all diastolic dysfunction. But the problem with how these guys have done it is they just looked at like a, a couple of things. They like looked at E on E prime. And I think this is a terrible way to measure diastolic dysfunction by itself. We'll look at another paper that's uh, another paper like by Landsborough. Oh, here we go. Involvement. Uh, so here we got left ventricle relaxation. These guys just really looked at the E prime. So they looked at just the E prime and the E to prime ratio, um, suggesting that uh, it was associated with uh, morbidity and mortality. You can't use something in isolation with diastolic dysfunction. The way we are looking at this is, is terrible at the moment. And oh, sorry, it's not terrible. The way we're looking at it is the, the best we can. But the way we are studying it in patients with severe sepsis and septic shock, we must stop looking at just single parameters, I think, right. um, because it's so difficult to do and you obviously having the same problems that I am. I think the change in the guidelines has been really useful. We, we did this study where we looked at uh, how many patients, it was something like a hundred patients or something. And we looked at them on day one and day three. And we used the old 2009 guidelines versus the 2016 guidelines. Yes. Yes. And the most important thing we found is that we uh, found the 2016 guidelines. Here we go this indeterminate group. So using the guidelines in the way that they were written, we found that we had almost three quarters of our patients were indeterminate 50 on day three and 50% on day one. That was much, much less when we were using the 2016 guidelines. We had only 6% versus 11%. I guess we simply, we put this together to say that we find the 2016 guidelines are much better at looking at diastolic dysfunction. And we suggested that if you want to do evidence or wanted to do studies in the critically ill we should all be doing it the same way and, and probably the best way of doing that is simply following the guidelines by the experts from america and europe but uh, we also know that written in the guidelines it says they're very explicitly on about paragraph two these guidelines are not for people who are perioperative or in kids and they don't even mention critically ill patients in the guidelines because it's really, really hard. And we know that when patients are tachycardic or when they've got critical illness, it's, it's difficult. So we've been looking at a few other ways of trying to, trying to do it. Um, and we came up with this way. This was Dave's idea, which I thought was really clever. So we say that a single parameter might not be any use because often we're dealing with uh, parameters that are very load dependent. We say that tissue Doppler maybe is the less is the least load dependence. And so we had this idea that maybe, I don't know if I've actually even got a picture of this in here. Yes. Uh, you know, you know how to measure the S prime and the E prime. And we had this idea that if you actually looked at the ratio between systolic motion to diastolic motion, this might give us an idea about whether there was diastolic dysfunction. We got this idea from looking at the, the guidelines and some amazing work by, uh, I don't know if you know, do you know a guy called Torrent Gwosp? He came up with this idea that the heart is uh, a myo myocardial sort of band that is all twisted together. Yeah. And he was one of the first guys about 50 years ago, I think, that came up with this idea that diastole is a very, very much an energy dependent process. It's not, uh, you, it's not a passive process. And in fact, it could be the first thing that goes. I mean, this is where the idea that Hef, PEF and HEF REF comes from, this idea that you can have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And actually what we find in these patients is that they've just got a lot of diastolic dysfunction. 
how we treat it is another matter. I don't think we're very good at treating it yet. But in the critically ill, let's take this idea that maybe in someone who's got severe sepsis, if you have diastolic dysfunction, this is maybe a very prognostic sign. And it's one of the first things to go, as in before you get systolic impairment, maybe you get diastolic impairment first. And if that's the case, having them tachycardic and fluid overloading them is possibly the worst thing that we could possibly do. So using this as an idea that systole and diastole are linked and that diastole maybe goes first, we came up with this idea that if you have, if you could look at the S prime and the E prime and have these as a, a ratio together, that we know that in young people, if they exercise, the S prime and the E prime both increase with exercise. So we thought up that if you had it in the critically ill, if the S prime increases as a patient becomes more tachycardic and works harder, but the E prime doesn't increase and stays low, that may be a sign of myocardial uh, Doppler uh, impairment. And we found that it was, it did kind of match up with the standard ways of, uh, standard ways of doing it. It was associated with raised E to E prime and we're trying to validate it at the moment, but maybe this is a way that we can look into it in the future. I, I, I don't know, but I'm sorry, maybe this is a long, a long winded question of saying, <laughs> I, I think diastolic dysfunction is really hard to do i think we must use the guidelines we must do it in the same way and we must understand that it's far from perfect in the critically ill and we've got a lot of work to do in this in this yes. area but the first thing we do is we do it all the same way yes of course your opinion sam is quite important for us because you are intensivist and the point of view of of the intensivist it sometimes is completely different to, to the cardiologist or the card echocardiographer so that's yeah. why it's very important your your comments because uh, the the critic the critical care scenario critical care setting sometimes or most of the times is completely different to uh, to uh, uh, the, the the setting where the cardiologist works. So for that's why for for the people and for for the audience is quite important your comments. Uh, and I mean I think it's also why it's important to have these kind of things uh, around the world. Um, I think with technology changing, it makes this pretty easier. And I can sit here and you know my board shorts on a Sunday. It's this is how we do it by talking like this, doing these kind of things, but making sure that we are first of all because this is a user dependent uh, piece of equipment that we are doing the same things whether you're in Monterey or whether you're in Sydney, we are doing the same things. And that's how we can then get proper data together to try and help us because I completely agree. I think what we are gonna find in the next few decades of looking at this is we are gonna have different parameters from the cardiologists yeah. because our patients are tachycardic and because they have acute pathology, not chronic pathology. Yeah. And we must start working together to figure this out and. I think we need to agree on what is important to study. I think diastolic dysfunction will come in there, right ventricle as well. And then we need to measure them the same and study them in a robust manner together. Yes, of course, Sam. And well, uh, uh, lastly, Sam, how do you integrate the other devices? You know, in the intensive care unit, you have echocardiography, of course, it's quite important, but how do you combine the echo machine with, for instance, the, the Pico or the Swangans, and how do you combine these, these, these devices? It's so interesting hearing your questions um, because they're exactly the same questions wherever I go teaching about this around this country. It's, um, I think we as a critical care community are, are stuck in, a, in very similar areas. I... Um, I love using these two modalities together. I think the strengths of echo are that it is non-invasive. I can do it at the bedside, but the limitations are that it's user dependent. And I get worried when I have a trainee who doesn't know what they're doing, telling me that the uh, measuring stroke volume when they're not adequately trained, uh, you know, it's, it's very user dependent and doing some of this stuff in people who are really sick is, is hard. I like the Pico machines or, or we use the volume views. Um, but I, I, like, I like these machines because you can just plug them in um, and uh, anyone can use them as long as they understand what the numbers mean. And with the newer machines, with the, uh, like I, I like the, the EV1000 because they tell you green if you're in the right spot and they tell you red when you're in trouble. Yes. But the problem is, the problem <laughs> is uh, 
that I find that you can only use these in about maybe 30, 40% of my patients, maybe less actually. And I think there's evidence out there, I've said that, which says that you can only use these in like 6% of patients. I think for these, for these monitoring devices to look at fluid status, I think you have to be fully mandatory ventilated. I think the evidence of using these things in patients who are spontaneously ventilated is dodgy. Yes. I think that they have to be on a decent uh, tidal volume, which is at least eight mils per kilogram for a short period of time. I think we must do passive leg raising in there uh, to assess for volume responsiveness. And I like trying to see if my echo, I, I, and I start all of this off by getting someone to do the transpulmonary thermodilution. I think in critically ill patients, the flow track has no place at all. So I think it has to be the thermodilution. But before the numbers come out, I do an echo. and I come to my conclusion with my echo, first of all, and then I look at the flow track. And I like to see if they match up because I know that they've both got limitations, right? And if they don't match up, I have to consider that one or both of them are out. And that forces me just to stop, uh, just call time out and just, just recheck my whole thought process on this patient. So I think, again, long-winded way, I'm sorry I, I wasn't clear, but I think they both have uses. I think with the echo, I can have a look at the overall function of that heart which I don't, uh, and have a look at how that heart is contracting and how the right ventricle is working in particular. And then I can use the thermodilution as a more of a continuous method to help me guide the patients. But I know if, you are, if you've got an arrhythmia or you're really, really tachycardic or you're spontaneously breathing, that transpulmonary thermodilution is, is inaccurate. And then I've got to be more reliant on my echo. So I do use them together. They've both got advantages, disadvantages. And before I start adding in this next layer of complexity, I must try and persuade myself to be a physician and be a doctor first and use, and use more robust things as, as well as these other parameters. Does, does that make sense? Yes, of course. It's very... do you, is it a similar way to you? Are you doing things in a similar manner? Yes, of course. Of course, Sam. It's the, the same manner. Um, I think that this is a, a very common issues around the world and many people in, in our country surely is questioning about this. Yeah. Um, uh, can you mention, if you want to, uh, shortly about the certifications in, in, in advanced echocardiography for non-cardiologists, of course. Uh, if, you want, if you can summarize in, in five points, for instance, um, <laughs> Am I talking too much in my replies? I'll keep my reply short. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sam. And well, because in, in, I think that in, in Latin America, especially, it's quite difficult for a non cardiologist yeah. to get a yeah. certification in advanced echocardiography. In, uh, Ameri uh, in, in North America, I, um, I mean no disrespect by this, but I think there are so many, you have so many societies there and so much politics with echo and critical care it's and cardiology is such a robust industry out there it's really hard and I, I think it's got lost a little bit i think the so i think it is difficult in northern america at the moment i think there are people who are desperately trying to change that the most robust at the moment and i'm biased probably because i'm an examiner for them i think is uh the australasian society of ultrasound in medicine has a two-year fellowship and it is big, it is robust, and it takes people right to a very, very advanced level where you are an expert in critical care echo. And it takes 750 studies, two years to do this, lots and lots of mentoring from cardiologists, and it's amazing. And most people can't do this. I think if we're looking at a level below this, the next most robust one, and again, this is, in, in my opinion, I'm not endorsed or paid by anyone, of course, um, is the one with the Europeans that they've just pulled out the uh, European uh, Diploma in Critical Care Echocardiography, which needs 250 studies. It needs good mentoring. Um, it's got an ex exit exam and a written exam. And it's, uh, and it's, and it's, um, it's, again, it's very robust. I think doing an exam is really important for people that want to practice echo at this level because um, 
it enforces you to read and to study right. uh, and make sure that we don't pick up bad techniques. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, the other ones that are available, there is one from England, which uh, is good, but doesn't have an exit exam, which I find important. And um, there are other ones from the university. Uh, there are other ones from the university in Melbourne. Um, the ones from America are, are not at the senior level yet, but there is the, the one that's very cardiology based is of course with the American Society of Echo. Right. Okay, Sam, thank you so much. Well, uh, there, there is some, uh, one more question. Uh, Sam, I'm going to read in Spanish and then I'm going to translate you, okay? Okay. Okay, well, uh, Pablo, Pablo Zúñiga, eh, nuestro gran amigo Pablo, eh, nos está haciendo algunas preguntas, como pueden ver, eh, cómo hacer más fácil eh, el, la, lo que es el, la predicción de la respuesta a volumen a través del, del flujo carotidio, en lugar de utilizar las, la vista cinco cámaras para el levantamiento pasivo de piernas, eh, especialmente en los intensivistas que están aprendiendo a usar eco. Okay, Sam, I'm going to translate you. One person is questioning about how do you uh, use the carotid flow time instead yeah. of the five chamber view in order to predict fluid responsiveness in the critical patient. Um, yeah, a uh, great question. Um, so there is some evidence that's, I think, pretty good out there that's talking about the fact that you can use carotid blood flows. I use... I, I generally find that most of the time you can get decent cardiac output from the apical five chamber. So I tend to do most of my analysis of stroke volume from the apical five chamber. I think um, the reason why I like that is because you get the accurate stroke volume as opposed to when with the carotid, I, uh, I, I tend to just look at the VTI. I, I use this mostly in cardiac arrest scenarios. So I look at this particularly when we are using um, uh, the, um, I don't know if you have the same devices, the automatic chest compression devices uh, in Mexico. Do you use those? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I particularly do it when we're moving from people doing um, standard CPR to using these devices. I will look at carotid blood flow. Um, that's when I will use it mostly. I think the evidence is pretty good. I don't think it's perfect. I think the conventional method is the apical five chamber. But if you can't get that, uh, I do find that useful. Um, but I don't feel confident in using this for, for things like the continuity equation or how I'm changing inotropes or integrating it with uh, a cardiac output monitoring device. So I use it, but infrequently, I think it's got some place and we need to study it better. Right, right, Sam. Thank you so much. And well, uh, lastly, one person is asking for your Twitter account, <laughs> Sam. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I don't have a Twitter account. I'm not even on. I'm not even on Facebook. I'm sorry. I have an email account. Uh, how about uh, uh -huh. I have an email if they wanted to contact me, but I, I don't have a Twitter account. I'm sorry. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not very cool. <laughs> <laughs> very very good Sam well it's very interesting there are a lot of topics of course uh, here we can uh, uh, keep on talking about this interesting topic all the night <laughs> but in, yes uh, but in this case well we have to finish the, the session Sam it, it is very very uh, we are very very happy for your presence here and I really appreciate for accepting this conference Sam uh, we are really, really happy. I know you. You have children and you have kids, and and you are in your in your. In, it's Sunday for you, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sun, Sunday midday here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. You are resting right now. So I I really appreciate for spend, uh, for spending this time with us. Um, well, um, I think this is that's it for 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 this time. Um, well, there are no there are no more questions. Um, well, uh, we are going to finish the session. Sam, uh, do you uh, do you want to to say something for the people? Absolutely. I'd just like to say thank uh, thank you very very much for inviting me along. Uh, it's really a privilege for me to to be talking to you over in Monterrey in Mexico, and uh, uh, I hope we get to meet up uh, again soon. Yes, uh, Sam, and maybe 
we can invite you sometimes. I I I, oh, I, I love have, to. I have your your email, and maybe we will invite you uh, for uh, some courses in Mexico. We oh, that would be amazing. And um, please uh, share my email uh, with anyone. It's great to keep in contact. I think this is how we grow as a subspecialty, and I think we are stronger together than apart. So yeah. uh, I hope again to see you, uh, see and work with you uh, in the future. Yes, thank you, Sam. I'm going to share your email in the Facebook page uh, where there are, there are people right now who ask questions about you. So I'm going to, thank to, you. to, to put the, your email in, in the comments. Thank you so much again. And I'll, and I'll talk to my seven-year-old daughter about how to get a Twitter account. Okay, very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Sam. It was, a, a, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. And we'll be in, contact, in contact soon, okay? See you later. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Bye. Sam. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.